On behalf of both Stem Cell Technologies and Precision Nanosystems, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Vandenhoek, and today we'll be discussing ways to accelerate T cell therapy research. I'm going to be moderating the first half of today's webinar, um, and I have the pleasure actually of introducing both of our speakers. So first up, we will have Dr. Sneha Balani. She's a product manager for immune cell culture products and has been here at Stem Cell Technologies for about three years. Sneha has a PhD from the University of British Columbia and currently oversees the product life cycle and strategy for stem cell solutions for advancing immunology and immunotherapy research. Second up today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Angela Zhang. She's a senior product manager at Precision, Precision Nanosystems, and she's responsible for their reagent product portfolio. And after obtaining a PhD in immunology at the University of Toronto, Angela has worked in various positions in the biotech industry and joined Precision Nanosystems in 2020. So with that, I'd like to immediately pass us over to Dr. Balani. Thanks, Amanda. Hi everyone, on behalf of Stem Cell Technologies, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to present to you and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Stem Cell is a global leader supporting life science research. We are headquartered here in Vancouver, Canada and have established offices around the world to maintain our high level of service to our customers. We provide direct sales through our offices located in North America, France, Germany, UK, Australia, Singapore, China, and Korea. To service the rest of the world in light gray, we work with a network of distributors covering 120 countries. We manufacture or supply over 2,500 uh, products and with, the broad range of, um, with a broad range of fields. Uh, and today our presentation is focused basically on T-cell research. Here at Stem Cell, we've worked hard over the years to ensure that the products we develop support every step of immune cell-based research, from sourcing our primary cells to cell isolation, activation, genome editing, cell expansion, differentiation, analysis, and cryopreservation. So before I go into the different topics, I wanted to get a pulse on which of these topics interest you the most. You will see a survey question pop up on your screen and I'll give you a couple of seconds to complete it. Excellent. I'm actually glad to see that there is interest in each of these areas. So let's start us off on sourcing material. For starting material, we provide high quality fresh biomaterials such as leukopax, peripheral blood, bone marrow and LRS cones. We also provide peripheral blood fractions that include fresh purified immune subsets, human platelet lysate, and plasma. You can also choose from our broad portfolio of cryopreserved purified cells or fresh purified immune subsets that are ready when you are. It is also important to note that stem cell complies with regulations and safety to ensure that all our human donor cells are ethically sourced from fully consented donors. Moving on to cell isolation, no matter what your application, we have reagents to meet your research needs across a wide variety of species, starting samples, and selection methods. In the interest of time today, we will focus briefly on our EasyCEP and RoboCEP platforms. For those of you who may not be familiar with EasyCEP, this technology combines the specificity of monoclonal antibodies with the simplicity of a column-free magnetic system. The result is an incredibly fast and easy protocol for isolation of highly purified immune cell populations. As you can see here, the protocol really is as simple as pouring your easy step reagents, which is antibody cocktail and magnetic particles to your cell sample incubating your labeled sample in an easy step magnet, and then simply pouring or pipetting off the supernatant to separate the labeled and unlabeled cell fractions. Here is an example of how human T cells isolated with either our negative, so that's the above two graphs, or our positive, which is our below two graphs, selection kits. As you can see, both of them show high purity and recovery of T cells with one of the huge advantages of EasySEP being how fast and easy the protocol is. 
It literally takes as little as eight minutes, saving researchers valuable time. It is easy to pour off and you're able to achieve those high purities of up to 99%. Our EasyStep isolation procedure is easily scalable through the use of different handheld magnets or can be fully automated using our RoboSep platforms. Additionally, we also offer support to our customers through custom isolation solutions, where if you have a phenotype in mind and that is not readily available on our website, you can get in touch with us. We definitely pride ourselves in our product scientific and customer support. So please reach out to us if you have questions or any challenging applications that we can help you with. On the culture front, we have three product lines that enable generation, maintenance and expansion of T cells. And I'll go into all of them a little briefly. So first of all, our Immunocal T cell portfolio consists of activation reagents, expansion medium, and supplements for the in vitro differentiation of naive CD4 T cells into TH1, TH2, and regulatory T cell lineages. These products are designed and developed in-house in to work seamlessly together and in your hands. We have a suite of products for human, like you can see, and we only offer the differentiation supplements for mouse, which I will not be covering today. So first on, onto our activators. So our immunocal T cell activation reagents are these soluble antibody complexes that cross-link receptors on the surface of T cells to initiate a cell activation cascade. They come in two flavors. So we either have cross-linking of CD3 and CD28 or CD3, CD28, and CD2. So shown here are histograms that you can see, um, which show an upregulation of CD25 as a marker of T cell activation following three days of culture with our immunocult activators. As you can see in these histograms for both CD3, CD28 activator, as well as the CD3, CD28, CD2 activator, we do see an upregulation of CD25 showing that these were activated. The images on the right that you can see here show that the expected T cell clustering, which is uh, expected after activation, and in contrast to a bead-based competitor product, which is on the right, the soluble nature of the immunocult activator does not actually require the removal of any magnetic beads uh, following culture, making it again a time-saving aspect. Now our Immunocult XF is a serum and xenofree T cell expansion medium. And when it is combined with the Immunocult activators that I spoke in the previous slide, you can expect robust T cell activation and expansion without the use of any magnetic beads or feeder cells or antigens. In this particular example, EasyCEP isolated T cells were expanded using the immunocult or a bead based activator in immunocult XF medium using a six well GREX plate. The figure on the left shows you that the expansion of T cells over 14 day culture. The figure on the right shows that the immunocult activated T cells in purple and orange maintain a higher viability throughout the culture compared to the bead based activation system in gray. We have conducted extensive uh, expansion cultures and have released a technical bulletin outlining what we believe is an optimized protocol for the expansion of human T cells using our immunocult reagents. Production of human T cells, particularly for cell therapy, is a complex multi-step process. A single administration of T cells for adoptive immunotherapy can require billions of expanded T cells. Optimized protocols for this scalable manufacture of T cells are essential, therefore, to maintain the therapeutic potential. Finding that balance, therefore, between maximizing your yield while also maintaining the desired cellular phenotype and function becomes critical. So throughout the development of our immunocult products, we noted that a key factor in achieving these was dependent on cell density during culture and particularly in the early time points. So I would recommend you uh, reach out to your local representative for a copy of this technical bulletin for such tips if you already have not done so. 
So why exactly should we be using this immunocult combination for activation and expanding our T cells? Well, our media is a defined formulation that is both serum and xenofree. It has been optimized and is ready to use for T cell activation, expansion, differentiation, and it also generates a high yield of cells with desired phenotype and function. And you absolutely do not need to substitute it with any human plasma derived serum, which often brings in variability into your culture system. It is a robust medium that will enhance any T cell workflow. So it can be used in combination with our immunocult activators, but you can also use reagents from other suppliers. Additionally, the soluble nature of our activators makes it a flexible option to activate T cells for large scale expansion. So switching gears a little bit, I do have a poll question for the audience about applications of T cells. So similar to before, you will see a pop up on your screen. So I'm hoping that you would have said there are various applications because from my knowledge, T cells can be used for various key applications for studying basic and translational biology, in cellular therapy, for disease modeling, toxicology screening, drug discovery, et cetera. But the point I'm trying to make here is while peripheral bud T cells can be easily isolated using a cell separation technology, such as EasySep, there is now an increasing interest in being able to generate them from alternate sources. And what I mean by this is maybe from cord blood CD34s or pluripotent stem cells. So both these methods are gaining traction due to the ease and flexibility of editing these cells during the development of T cells, as opposed to editing differentiated cells that can be more challenging. Additionally, pluripotent stem cells are becoming a popular source of universal cells starting to generate immune cells. So to serve these areas, stem cell has two products on the market now. The first one is the stem span T cell generation kit. This is an optimized 2D protocol that generates double positive CD4, CD8 positive T cells from cord blood derived CD34 cells in 42 days. This is a serum-free and feeder-free formulation that is able to generate up to 20,000 double positive T cell per input CD34 cell with high yield and frequency as shown in these plots. For PSCs, we have another kit, which is called the STEM diff T cell kit, which is an optimized two-step protocol. So this first generates CD34s from PSCs, and then these are subsequently enriched using EasySap. And these CD34s then make your double positive T cells. The total protocol for the PSC workflow is around 40 days. And similar to the previous uh, product, this is a feeder free and serum free formulation that is able to generate up to 60 double positive T cells per input PSC derived CD34 cells. Always do note PSCs can be variable. So we have definitely tested multiple ES and IPS lines, and that's how we came up to the average number. I also understand how these protocols can be more complicated. So if you wanna learn more about them, please do reach out to us. Coming on to analysis and cryopreservation part of the workflow, we offer a suite of antibodies, elisicates, dyes, and services. But the product I specifically wanted to highlight today is a cryopreservation medium. So CryoStore is a GMP manufactured animal component in serum-free T-cell cryopreservation medium. This medium ensures high viability and maximum cell recovery after long-term storage. It is also readily available with all documentation required for clinical applications. I also wanted to highlight that we can provide services through our contract assay services team or CAS, where you can leverage our expertise and knowledge, but for your specific applications. So if there is an assay or an application that you would like to do, but do not have the resources or material for, this is definitely something you can leverage us for. So with the limited amount of time available today, I only showed you a snapshot of products that we offer into an A to Z workflow for T-cell um, research. 
However, I did want to take the last two minutes to address how stem cell can support T cell therapy research and applications. So over the past 10 years, stem cell has successfully supported 50 clinical trials where our products have been used as ancillary materials. We have a dedicated team that is able to guide customers through these discussions and support the use of our products in clinical applications on a case-by-case -case basis. Often, CGMP compliant reagents are not required by the FDA or Health Canada for preclinical and early phase clinical studies. So we are able to provide custom solutions and guidance to meet customers' specific compliance needs and documentation. And hence, uh, stem cell products can be successfully integrated into a CAR T cell workflow. So I've tried to depict that here. So we start with a leukopack. You can isolate using EasySEP. You can activate using the immunocult activators and finally expand an immunocult XF to complete that workflow. So please reach out to your local representative or visit stemcell.com for further information on how we can support you with your research needs. Um, our motto at Stem Cell is scientists helping scientists. So I truly hope that I was able to provide you with some useful information today. And I'm happy to continue the conversation to answer any questions you may have on these products that I presented or any other topics that may be of interest to you. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Sneha. Um, all right, so I do see that we have uh, a number of questions uh, in the Q&A section. So to reiterate, uh, if you do have questions, please do submit them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, so we'll try to get through all of them. If we can't get through all of them, we'll certainly work uh, to address your questions um, and respond to you directly either during or after uh, the webinar. So uh, Sneha, the first question that I see here, actually the first couple of questions refers to the cell isolation portion of the portfolio. So can you comment on uh, when isolating the T cells for this, these particular applications, um, do we have recommendations on whether we should be using positive or negative selection? Mm -hmm, for sure. So it really depends on your application. Um, if you want to leave your cells untouched, negative isolation makes sense. You don't want to by activate them by mistake. For purity, usually, if you have a specific phenotype in mind, then positive selection is what you want. For T cells specifically, I showed you both our positive and negative selection methods work beautifully. So you could go with either. Although Amanda is also a cell isolation expert, so the isolation <laughs> questions can definitely be handled by her. Perfect. All right. Well, so in that vein, I'm actually going to address the second question that I see here myself. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, are there ways to remove magnetic particles from the isolated cells? Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, stem cell offers a particular uh, flavor of EasySEP, if you will, um, called EasySEP Release. Um, and we have a number of kits that are in this portfolio, including um, a CD3. Um, isolation kit for T cells. And this technology allows you to basically do your positive selection for CD3 positive cells. And then at the end of that isolation, you can remove the magnetic particles. Um, and that lets you uh, sort of remove that uh, complication from your downstream assays if that's something that you're concerned about. Um, so moving on, we have a couple of questions uh, about the cell culture side of things. So the first one, um, which you sort of addressed, um, but maybe not this exact question. Uh, there's a question about expanding iPSC-derived T cells with immunocult media. Mm -hmm, that's a great question. So after our stem diff T cell generation kit, the T cells that are formed, we can maintain them in immunocult right now. So our R&D team is actively working on expansion studies of these PSE-derived cells. Um, however, right now we can only show maintenance for a several number of days. We don't see that much expansion in immunocult, but it's an active study and we are hoping it's just a tweaking of a protocol. So something to look forward to for sure. Great. Um, so speaking of expansion, um, there's a question here about how uh, cell density can impact T-cell expansion. 
Mm -hmm. So I did mention this a little bit. Cell density plays an important role for T cell expansion for sure. Um, what our R&D has seen in their studies is it's usually during the early time points. So if you do get the technical bulletin, you will notice they recommend a bunch of split ratios. The reason they do that is that over time, we notice that too many cells or too little cells, both were detrimental to culture, and you wouldn't get the best yield out of your cells uh, if you were not keeping tabs on how your cells are growing. So it definitely plays a role. It's usually in the early stages, and we definitely have recommendations for what kind of split ratios you should be using, depending on how, what you see your culture is doing. Um, so I see possibly the most popular question that we get uh, yes. many times a day. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you that one. Of course. Um, so the question is, uh, can you use a serum-free T-cell medium and activation reagents, so our immunocult product line, uh, yeah. for GMP production at this moment? Yes. So um, great question. Uh, I did, this is what I was trying to address in one of my slides, depending on where you are in your clinical discovery phase. So if you're in still in translational research discovery phase, et cetera, you can use a serum free xeno free formulation with a certificate of analysis, et cetera. So the right documentation to do your research. But when you come to the late stage clinical trials, that is where the GMP compliance becomes all the more important. Um, and actually, Stem cell is working on a GMP compliant medium. So this is something to look forward to summer of next year. So we definitely have something on the horizon coming up, but depending on where you are in your discovery phase, you might be able to use what is available on the shelf today. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll work through just a couple more questions here before we start the second uh, mm -hmm. portion of the webinar. Um, I would say there's a few technical questions here, which we may address um, offline separately. Yeah. Um, but I do see uh, when generating T cells from pluripotent stem cells, mm -hmm. uh, what factors can affect the yield of that procedure? Yeah, so there is some system variability, of course, with any culture system. But most importantly, pluripotent stem cells, it's the cell line that you're used to. So we have tried multiple ES and IPS lines. And even in that, we saw there were some high performance and some low performers. So we would recommend if you have a suite of cell lines available, you do your due diligence and pick the high yield cell lines, uh, just because sometimes there are cell lines that will not uh, give you the desired performance. Therefore, our culture system was developed using multiple. However, I do understand usually labs only have access to a couple. So yes, you will see variability depending on the cell line you're using. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll make note of the uh, number of questions that we have left, um, and we can address those, uh, Sneha, you can work uh, offline to make sure we're Perfect. getting answers to those. Yeah. Um, but with that, I think I will thank you for your great presentation, and I'll pass things over to uh, Angela. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you, Sneha, for that great presentation. That was uh, very informative. I think I've learned a lot through that as well. All right, great. Um, yeah, uh, again, I just I, I want to reiterate the sort of welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. Uh, so in this section, we're going to uh, explore together how you can approach T cell therapy differently with lipid nanoparticles or LMP. Uh, there has been a lot of interest in lipid nanoparticles or LMP as a technology, as this is what delivers the mRNA as part of the mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccines from, as you know, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. Um, and since then, of course, there's a lot of interest in understanding how, you know, we can leverage this technology uh, in applications beyond vaccines, uh, for instance, cell therapies. So today I'm going to walk you through, through some data uh, using this technology and specifically uh, our uh, LMP reagent uh, kit, Genval LM T cell kit for mRNA, and show you some of the advantages over um, some of the existing gene delivery technologies right now uh, in the field. So with that, um, let's get into it. Uh, at the end of it, we'll turn over to Martin, who will moderate the Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to submit them through the Q&A uh, chat box. Now, before we get started, though, I think it would be good to get a sense of this audience. Um, you know, assuming you are using a non-viral gene delivery method, 
um, or that, um, you know, um, where you're considering what are your most important considerations and you can choose more than one here. All right, great. Thank you so much. Yes, the high transfection efficiency is certainly, you know, definitely something, you know, a lot of people are interested in achieving. Cell viability, a real important uh, metric here as well, and certainly very important with primary cells that have limited uh, capability to, to expand. So that initial um, cell viability is, is super important. Of course, the ability to scale, right? So especially important if you um, you know, want to take your program to the clinic and of course, always reduce cost. So thank you so much for that. And I hope to touch upon uh, most of these points throughout my presentation today uh, with our technology and also with this kit. All right, so before we get into the technology and the kit, I just, I do want to mention that our mission at Precision Nano Systems is to accelerate the creation of transformative medicine that significantly impacts human well-being. And this is reflected in our products and services um, uh, that we offer that support your entire drug development path. Um, and I will touch upon this at the end of the presentation. I also want to point out that we, you know, throughout the pandemic, we have worked with a number of vaccine uh, researchers and drug developers to move their program forward. Um, we have also received funding from the Canadian government to develop our, our own COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and uh, we'll actually be able to show some of the uh, manufacturing and scale up data uh, as a result of that program um, uh, on October 28th at our uh, symposium. And I'll give you a little bit more information there at the end. Uh, I won't touch upon the vaccine so much in this presentation, uh, but, but certainly we have um, uh, done a lot in the last um, uh, 18 months around, around this area. So it's quite an exciting time for us to actually see this technology being utilized in, in, in the clinic. So genetic medicines are the future. You know, with the ability to silence, express, or edit genes, it essentially allows us to target any genes in any way, making this an incredibly versatile uh, type of therapy. And again, with the approval of the COVID-19 vaccines and actually previously uh, the gene therapy on Patro, it, it, this is now a clinically validated um, technology. And with that, um, you know, the regulatory rigor that goes into um, demonstrating this is a safe technology and that it can be manufactured not just at the small scale, but actually at a commercial scale. And just to get on the same page about what we mean by genetic medicine in this presentation, we're really talking about um, a lipid nanoparticle uh, with a payload that's encapsulated. So that's essentially composed of a cationic ionizable lipid, cholesterol, helper lipid stabilizer, and a nucleic acid payload. And in this presentation, we're really talking about an RNA payload. And there are different ways to deliver um, this type of genetic medicine. Um, you know, on the left here, this is really, again, the COVID-19 vaccines and also the gene therapy on Patro, um, which is administered directly into the body. So this is an in vivo approach. On the right here, we're really looking at an ex vivo approach. And this is really what we're talking about here today for, for the cell therapy applications, uh, where the LNP RNA is used to modify the immune cells, and in this case, T cells, and those engineered T cells are then uh, administered back into the body. Now, ever since the you know, first um, FDA-approved uh, CAR T-cell therapy that came to the market, there has been a lot more CAR T-cell therapies in the clinic. In fact, several uh, were approved early this year. So there seems to be an accelerated uh, number of, of therapies being uh, brought to the clinic. And going beyond that, there are many other ongoing preclinical studies and clinical trials and, and really looking at uh, new diseases and new targets and new approaches. And throughout this sort of exploration into new diseases and new targets, allogeneic approach have become quite popular uh, in, in certainly in the, in the research uh, arena and has the advantage of certainly using healthy donor cells, for instance, um, and the potential off the shelf nature of this type of approach. So that's very uh, enticing from a manufacturing perspective. 
And, and throughout it all, there has been a lot more interest in exploring non-viral gene delivery methods to, to target these you know, um, new diseases, again, uh, to new targets and new approaches. Now the viral vector mediated exo gene delivery is, is a great method. It has been around for decades and it is currently, uh, it is used in current FDA approved cell therapies. However, there are a lot of challenges around the cumbersome and expensive manufacturing of viral vectors. And in certain you know, scenarios, there are some lingering safety concerns related to the potential oncogenic insertions into the host genome. So one of the non-viral alternatives out there um, that are being explored in both preclinical research and, and clinical studies is electroporation. Uh, and it's actually a pretty good um, you know, method, but one of the biggest challenge with this method is it tend to be very, very harsh on the cells and that leads to low cell viability and in turn low cell yield. Again, this is a big problem when you're thinking about um, working with uh, primary cells um, that, that, that initial hit is, is really quite uh, detrimental. And, and especially since these cells have limited capability to, to expand. Um, again, in general, it's, it has pretty good transfection efficiency, but I've certainly have seen cases where the transfection efficiency is low and or inconsistent. And overall, it is not a, a, a system that's straightforward to scale. Lipid nanoparticles or LMPs are really able to overcome these challenges head on with these challenges associated with both viral vectors and electroporation. Um, and, and part of this comes from the technology itself and part of this comes from you know, our expertise in this area and, and our design that went into this kit specifically. Uh, so I'm going to go through these uh, bullet points in the next few slides in, in more details. So again, so LMP now are clinically validated and to deliver RNA um, and siRNA specifically in 2018 on Patro and mRNA recently uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine. So again, it means that it is a safe technology and it can be manufactured at, at a very large scale for commercial use. And, and when you think about vaccine sort of scale, that, that is a massive scale. And the LMP actually leverage an, an existing endogenous cellular path, pathway. Uh, so this is depicting how, how this um, enters the cell. Uh, essentially, LMP forms a complex with APOE, and that um, mimics the low density lipoprotein or LDL, and it's taken up into the cell via LDL, LDL receptor mediated pathway. There's a change in the pH that facilitates the endosomal escape where the lipids within the LMP interact with the lipids within the endosome that um, leads to the release of nucleic acid into, into cytoplasm. So you can see this is quite a gentle way of introducing genetic materials into a cell. And this is certainly something, um, uh, I'll show you the data later with our kid, we see quite a high cell viability. Um, and we think partly due to how gentle this, this mechanism is. So, so we have been in this space for, for 10 years now and, and certainly have done a lot in the last, um, you know, during the pandemic with the vaccine uh, efforts. So we have a lot of understanding around formulation uh, design and, and also understanding the cell biology. So we, we put that all together and designed this kit um, called Genval LMT cell kit for mRNA. And it is an LMP reagent mix that's essentially ready to go. And that has been optimized for the delivery of mRNA into activated primary human T cells using LMP formulated uh, on this instrument uh, you can see on the right here called Nano Assembler Spark. Uh, it is a really quite a, um, a compact unit uh, that can be put in the biosafety cabinet very easily. Um, and it's designed to be uh, quite um, intuitive to use and you really do not require any LMP expertise to, to have, it, have this in your hands and start um, you know, validating LMP as, as a technology in your, in your model system. Uh, we also designed it so that the delivery system method is, uh, can be easily integrated into any standard T-cell culture workflow. And you heard a bit about the workflow from Sneha in the previous uh, section. 
Um, we have a protocol in the user guide, so you can, you know, basically have this ready to go. And there's some flexibility around using fresh or cryopreserved human T cells. Now, at the end of the day, what we're trying to, you know, enable researchers to do is not just having a transaction tool per se, but really a clinically relevant method uh, that can be scaled uh, for activo gene delivery to advance the development of T cell therapies. Now, let's just go through the workflow a little bit before we get into the performance data. Um, and, he, you know, you probably saw something pretty similar in Sneha's presentation, but essentially, you know, we have, we purify the cells from either the peripheral blood, or perhaps you have some cryopreserved primary cells, you activate and expand them. Um, and what we found in our hands, uh, the ideal time to treat these cells uh, for, uh, with the LMP RNA uh, is around day four. Uh, and this is where we see 80% uh, of the CD25 expression. Uh, and that seems to be a really good indicator of success. Um, and after that, as soon as 24 hours later, you're able to uh, analyze these cells, looking at um, percentage of engineered cells, cell viability, and protein expression. Uh, and we're going to show you some data in the next few slides. Uh, so we use stem cells, um, uh, cell isolation product. We use the primary cells as well. Uh, and uh, the activators and immunocolon XF in the, in the cell culture. In terms of gene transfer, you know, you can see uh, this is quite straightforward. It's very rapid as well. Uh, so on nanoassembler Spark, again, it's a very intuitive instrument. Uh, this is our smallest instrument for discovery research. Uh, essentially, you just need to pipette the mRNA into one well of the cartridge. LMP reagent in the second well of the cartridge, you put that into this small instrument, it would do the microfluidic mixing, um, and then you would just collect the mRNA LMP at the end from the third well in the cartridge. So it's, it's incredibly straightforward. This whole formulation takes less than five minutes. Um, in fact, it probably takes less than one minute. Now with mRNA LMP, once you have it, you just need to pipette it into your cell culture uh, with a P10 or a P20. There's, you know, there's no need for sort of extensive uh, mixing with the cells. You just drop it in and that will be it. Uh, and I do want to point out that with this kit and this instrument, uh, our thought is really, you know, support that discovery research. So you'll be getting around a seven to nine million CAR T cells per kit. Now, if you're working with a larger scale, when you move to preclinical or, or process development, uh, we can certainly work with you on that. Now, when we were, you know, developing this product, we, we did compare it with, um, you know, the other non-viral uh, alternative on the market with electroporation, and we did look at the differences in terms of the workflow. Uh, and again, on the left here with the with the T cell kit, um, we say one hour here, and that includes the uh, preparation of the mRNA solutions, and also a ribogreen assay that allows you to look at encapsulation efficiency, uh, and also determine the ideal dose. Uh, for yourself. So all together, uh, it's less than an hour. And again, once you're done, you drop it into the cells um, and that's it. You don't have to touch the cells really beyond that. Uh, and there's no additional mixing with the cells. Now, in comparison with electroporation, and again, uh, this differs a bit, you know, from electroporator to electroporator, but you do need to take the cells, generally speaking, you do need to take the cells from the culture, centrifuge, wash them, resuspend them in a specialized buffer, electroporate them, and then remove the cells and place them back into media. And, and oftentimes you wanna rest the cells for quite a long time to let them recover. Um, and in, in some cases you will want to rest them overnight uh, to, to make sure you, know, you preserve as many cells as you can. And, and that can take as long as 24 hours. So when you look at them, you know, side by side, there's cer certainly more extensive cell manipulation with, uh, with electroporation, and it, it, it is a longer process as well. Now, when we looked at the performance of our kit, it was pretty striking that we were able to get, uh, you can see that the, with the T cell kit, we got greater proportions of engineered T cells in teal color. Uh, compared to electroporation and orange. And this is true for both uh, G GFP and a more therapeutically relevant uh, model, which is the CD19 car. 
Now, when we look further at this, at uh, the MF5, and it was kind of interesting, is that the T-cell kid gives you a very uniform um, population of engineered uh, T-cells for both the GFB and CD19 car construct, perhaps a bit more so with GFB. In comparison, electroporation certainly has that negative peak, but with a positive peak, it, it sort of spreads across a range of GF, uh, uh, MF5 intensity, which suggests that it is not a uniform uh, population that were um, engineered even within the positive population. And this is something we observed consistently um, across the different experiments we've done. So now with the T-cell K, you get greater proportions of engineered T-cells with uniform protein expression. Um, of course, now the large question is, are these cells uh, highly viable? And they are. And then this is a big question, right? And this is sort of the big disadvantage of the electroporations that really low you know, cell viability as a result of it being a harsh treatment. And this is what we saw uh, you know, as an advantage, advantage with our T-cell kit is that, is that uh, the cells remain highly viable after the treatment. Uh, you can see here in the, in the teal color uh, for both the uh, GFP and CD19 CAR uh, constructs. Whereas with electroporation, there's a massive hit on, on cell uh, uh, viability. And this is true with or without the um, RNA payload. Um, I don't have the data here, <clears throat> excuse me, but this is similar uh, for cell yield as well. So now you have a kit that gives you a greater proportion of engineered cells with uniform protein expression. And these cells are highly, highly viable and, and you get a high yield out of it. What else do you need? Well, I think this is where you potentially would want a tunable system, right? Because you're not always wanting uh, sort of the highest transfection possible. You want to achieve that uh, the ideal balance between transfection efficiency and, and viability. And this is what you can do with our kit. You can see there's a dose dependent increase in transfection efficiency and protein expression. Uh, the viability largely stays you know, close to really 100%. There's a bit of a drop at a higher sort of dose, but you know, you're still looking at uh, over 80% here. And this is similarly shown with the CD19 car construct. Uh, again, there's dose dependent increase in transfection efficiency and protein expression. And again, viability stays largely unchanged. Um, at a higher dose, it drops a bit, but you can see it's still around 90% uh, viable. Now, once you have these engineered uh, CAR Ts, uh, you know, there's a number of assays you can do to look at the functionality. And what we've done here is the tumor uh, cell killing assay. Uh, and we have the, the, the CAR positive factor cells, the CAR negative factor cells. We, and we, in terms of the uh, target cell line, we have CD po CD19 positive and CD19 negative. Uh, essentially, what it's showing is that the CD19 CAR um, T cells that were engineered were able to kill. CD19 positive cell lines in a dose dependent manner. So these cells are indeed functional. So then in summary, you know, what you're really getting uh, with this kit is the ability to use LMP in your lab, you know, for your, for your biological system right away. Um, you know, it gives you a greater proportion of engineered T cells with uniform protein expression. These cells remain highly viable after the treatment. Uh, it's a system that can be tuned and you can get it all with a simple protocol with very minimal T cell manipulation. So I hope that um, I was able to provide you with some helpful data around um, the advantages of using lipid nanoparticles uh, in cell therapy research. Um, now, you might be wondering, what can I use it for um, beyond uh, what we have shown here? Uh, and of course, on the left here, this is exactly the scenario we we're imagine this kit would be used uh, with delivery of a CAR mRNA construct. Um, in, you know, so one of the possibility of, of using this is in exploring things that has a heterogeneous uh, tumor environment that you may want to uh, employ the strategy of uh, delivering multiple CAR mRNA constructs. And a similar idea in the middle here with the TCR uh, mRNA construct. And again, this kit and the Spark instrument will be great at enabling to screen uh, these constructs quickly and identify your, your targets, certainly at the discovery stage. 
And final, finally, the one on the right, and I think, you know, it's quite interesting. And I think this is where LNP uh, can provide a lot of these um, really interesting advantages over existing technologies, um, is these uh, single or multiplex gene editing by delivering uh, Cas9 as an mRNA and a single guide uh, RNA. And an example of this, for instance, uh, uh, would be knocking out track for allogeneic type of, of approaches. Uh, and this is something we'll have data for uh, very soon, so stay tuned for that. Now, before we end, um, you know, I do want to show you guys um, the solutions that we offer for the full drug development path. So again, today we talked a lot about uh, the Genvo Island T cell can and SPAR instrument, which really puts us in the discovery stage. But as you can see, we have the instrument that allows you to scale from discovery to preclinical all the way to clinical development and, and beyond. Um, and with your reagents, uh, again, we, we have reagents across the entire um, range um, uh, of, of the, the stages you're in, uh, and we have both research use uh, reagent and also um, uh, clinical uh, lipids and things like that. Now, in addition to the product and uh, solutions we offer, we also offer services, and this is really a lot of our expertise um, uh, in, in sort of a tangible way from screening, formulation development, process development, scale up, tech transfer, and manufacturer and CMC support. Uh, so, we, so really we have that entire uh, solution for the full drug development path. If you have any, any questions about any of this, uh, do let me know and I can direct you to the right team members. And if you have any further inquiries, do reach out to me and, and again, I can, I can connect you. Uh, just a bit of a plug. Uh, around sort of vaccine applications, we do have a symposium that's coming up on October 28th, and this is where we're going to uh, present some new data uh, of um, from both the preclinical and, and the scale of manufacturing from our uh, clinical program uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine development efforts. So with that, um, I will turn it to Martin to moderate the Q&A. And thank you again for joining. Yeah, thanks, Angela, for this excellent talk. Really, really interesting. And we also have a lot of questions already, which is nice to see. Let's focus in the first part on a bit on, on payloads that we can work up with, because I have multiple questions coming from that direction. So we've shown that mRNA is basically work, right? So we can express proteins that are either there intracellularly or can be expressed on the surface of the T cells. But what is ever, when we talk about other payloads, would be a CRISPR Cas machinery work? And how should that machinery look like? Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent question, and uh, I kind of alluded to it. Um, so yes, this kit can be used for uh, CRISPR Cas9 type of gene editing approach, and we'll have that data. Uh, we'll have some data and protocol on that coming up uh, very soon. Um, so what we found is that it, it's uh, this kit is quite amenable for doing that, uh, as long as the Cas9 deliver as mRNA. Um, so, so that is a system uh, that we have some data and protocol for. So yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting application uh, and look forward to uh, present that to you guys in the next round. All right. Um, and then the next question is so tied into that. I think I saw it in the chat, but I still pull it. Um, if people could also use a combination of RNA and a reproductive protein, or would they need to transfer basically that machinery into a fully RNA-based uh, approach? Sorry, can you repeat that? I think I... So I, basically the question is, so when speaking about CRISPR-Cas, you could either have like Cas9 or as an mRNA, or you could use that as an SDRNP, like the, the, the actual protein. Right, right, right. So would that work? Yeah, I think, I mean, um, I think in, in, in both cases, there's the potential sort of working. Um, I don't see why not, but in terms of... Um, immediately working with the, this kid based on our testing, we do find uh, the Cas9 as mRNA uh, being a more sort of amenable uh, to, our, to our existing kit. Uh, certainly the Cas9 as an RNA, uh, uh, sorry, R RNP uh, for delivery uh, would be an interesting question uh, that we want to explore as, as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And maybe if you allow me to comment on that, I think looking at like the physical cover properties of both payloads, I feel that might be RNP is more difficult because it might require a different um, particle type to be delivered into the cells. But if you're interested in that, we definitely have something we can 
basically discuss how you would enable that too. All right, and the last question to Paytos is, um, and I know this is a tricky one. Um, so when people want to work with DNA, right? So what would we say about that? So what would be your answer here? Yeah, we do, we do get a lot of questions around that. Um, and I think that, you know, has to do a lot with where, um, you know, we, we, we um, you know, our guess is that it has to do with where it's delivered. Um, so mRNA is in the, in the cytoplasm, uh, the DNA is into the nucleus. So at this time, our uh, reagent really is more amenable for RNA type delivery. Um, uh, you know, obviously delivering DNA is a big question in the field and certainly something we're interested in, in, in exploring. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I think that wraps up that part of the Q&A and now we can maybe switch a bit more to application-based questions on how to actually work with the T-cell kit. So mm -hmm. when we treat LPs um, with the T-cells, do we need to remove them or do some post-processing with them or can we just leave them out uh, of cells with the LMPs? Yeah, you can just add the LMP, uh, you know, with the RNA payload, right? Once you formulate it, you put in uh, with the T cells and that's it. You don't need to remove it. Um, and as you can see in our cell viability data, it's well tolerated. The cell viability remains very high. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then um, based on looking at the data, so I think there are multiple questions that are actually, so can you tell which elect operation method exactly we did used? That's the first question. And the second one would be if we, because we spoke about comparing it to electrification, the second one would be, did we also compare it to antiviral vectors or viral vectors and how would that compare? I think that's, that's the question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, those are really excellent questions. So with electroporation, uh, we used Lanza's, uh, the uh, nuclear factor uh, system, uh, which is also a system that's used quite a lot in the field. There are obviously other options out there. Um, uh, we, we heard, um, we haven't tested those uh, other options, but we have heard um, uh, from our uh, customers or researchers that um, you know perhaps it's similar kind of comparison as we've seen here. Um, and uh, the second question about, right, the viral or lantiviral yeah. kind of system, right. So we have not done that comparison. Um, uh, as you know, the viral vector media gene delivery are, are stable, right? So that's, um, um, uh, that's, that is what that technology is very well uh, at doing. Uh, for our system uh, is with the CD19 card delivery, it is a, a transient expression. The, you know, we've seen it up to uh, five to seven days of expression. Um, now that is different with the gene editing approach, uh, which is a much longer uh, change. So there are some differences in, in terms of uh, that, in terms of applications uh, for LMP. Awesome, thank you for that. And I think that nicely ties in with another question. Um, I have here. So we also already spoke about how long we see like uh, the expression after using an mRNA based approach. So the second question is, so how long do you think we see an expression? You said a few days, but can you a bit be, be more specific? How long will be a car uh, expressed on the surface, for example, when or speaking about therapies? And secondly, do the cells still expand after the treatment? And if yes, um, basically, what happens to the CT19, for example, after the cell have expanded, if they expand? Yeah, so those are really great questions. Uh, and again, we see sort of expression up to five to seven days. Uh, we've done some of the killing assays. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know if we've done it to that sort of extent. I definitely, we sort of looked at earlier time points uh, when it comes to the functionality. Uh, it's just something I, I, I don't think we've actually done. I can check on that and, and get back to you uh, to see if we have data on sort of the later stage uh, tumor cell killing. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's the extent to which we have tested. Um, yeah. Awesome. And, and did we check if the cells are still like viable and also like still expanding after the treatment? Did we look into that? Yeah. Yeah, so we've done, uh, I don't have this data here. Um, uh, if you have attended some of our other sort of presentations at the various conferences, we do have a slide on the cell yield. 
Um, so we, we did look at sort of like, you know, uh, expansion um, uh, and, then, and then the treatment and then the expansion afterwards. So we do like looked at the total cell number uh, before and after treatment. Uh, and after treatment, I, I believe we looked at it for, for um, probably as long as I said previously, five to seven days. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And I think uh, we can squeeze in uh, two last questions because they seem to be short. So we spoke about T-cells. So if you look at a Gen Y L and T-cell kit, does it work also for other cell types and if you have switched cell types, uh, if people could try with the kit? Yeah, we, we, we get that question quite a bit, actually. Yeah, um, I, yeah I have to say there's some cell specificity when it comes to the, these sort of ex, uh, ex vivo approaches with LMP, at least in our experience. Uh, so this kit is really, really optimized for uh, human primary T cells. Uh, that being said, um, you know, I would say if you're looking at macrophages, perhaps you can, you can give it a try. Uh, we've heard from you know researchers in the field that um, that that works to a certain extent, uh, but again, this kit is really um, optimized for human primary T cells. Thank you, and I think I add that with a question. Um, people are asking, is the Genwa LM T cell kit available globally? And I want to expand that question. If the answer is yes, or it's available in your region, how would you be able to get the kit and start working with us? Um, yeah, it is, uh, it is a product that's available globally um, uh, in terms of your specific region. You know, we'll, we'll follow up maybe and see how we can help you get your hands on this kit. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, with that, I think we um, basically run out of question and also out of time. So thanks a lot for all the answers. Um, thanks to the team of PNI and Stelzel for being here, giving, giving these amazing talks and thanks to the audience for listening and see you soon. Great, thank you.